continuing on in our study, follow me. We're in Psalm 78, but this is just a springboard verse. Follow me, furnished. Follow me, furnished. Psalm chapter 78, by way of introduction, we'll read through the first eight verses here. Psalm 78, verse 1. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. Verse 9, it says, The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turn back in the day of battle. Here Ephraim takes center stage in this psalm, armed and with bows, furnished, prepared, it seemed, for the battle. At least outwardly, they had their armaments they had their weapons and what was missing that caused them though to turn back in the day of battle you got everything you need the battles before you and they tuck tail turned and ran what i believe was missing was the established testimony that ought to have been known to them was far from their hearts and from their minds. As it says in the verse previous, their heart was not set aright. Their spirit was not steadfast with God. When we truly know the testimony, it's one thing we talk about to know Jesus and to know Jesus, right? I'm saying the same thing, but we all know what I'm getting at. You can know of, you can know the stories, you can know who he is, what he did. I know Jesus, yes. But when you know him, there's a difference. Personally, intimately, you know him. If we truly know what's revealed in verse 4 there, we will not hide these things. If we know the praises of the Lord, you will not have to command us to show them to our children, to the generation to come. When you truly know the praises of the Lord and know Him, His strength and His wonderful works are clearly evident in our lives. When we know something, we we believe it. Not only do we believe it, we trust it. Not only do we trust it, we accept it and set it to our account. We set it aright in our hearts. We, We are steadfast in that thing when we truly know it. Verse 7, it says that they might set their hope in God. And that's where our hope needs to be. And not forget the works of God. And that's what we need to have clear in our mind. All the great things he hath done. To God be the glory. Hope in, don't forget all that he has done. Especially in the day of battle. And this is Ephraim's problem, I believe. They were armed. They were furnished. They have everything that they needed to go to the battle, and yet they turned back because their hope was not in God, because they did not have Him in the forefront of their memory, all the great works that He had done. Therefore, they were not able to keep His commandments. And that's kind of the order there. I mean, you see that in verse 7? Set your hope in God. Forget not His works, keep His commandments. Right? You're not going to keep anything God does if you're not hoping in Him and trusting in His works through you. Ephraim, armed, prepared for, rebelled. I believe the Bible is in, 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 or is showing us. It's indicating that they rebelled, not believing, but they turned back. And really, that is rebellion in our heart. 
When God has shown us all these great things, when we believed on Him and trusted Him for our salvation, when we turn in the day of battle, we're rebelling against Him. Because He sets it forward. Look, God's not going to lose this battle. God's not going to cause you to fall. Why are you turning back? Have faith. Go forward. Don't rebel against God, but do what He has intended for you in that day of battle. Nevertheless, they turned back. They were not steadfast in spirit. Their heart was not fixed and set aright. Verse 10, it says, carrying on with the example that we have in Ephraim and what it did for future generations, we can see. Look, the first part of that psalm, it says, Give it to your children, that the generation to come might know. These children which are born after should arise and declare it unto their children, and it should be to their children, and to be to their children after, that all might hope and follow after and remember the works of God. But Ephraim sets an example. A new precedent is established here in them. Verse 10, it says, They kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in His law and forget his works and his wonders that he had showed them. Marvelous things did he in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt, in the field of Zoan. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through, and he made the waters to stand as an heap. In the daytime also he led them with a cloud, and all the night with a light of fire. He clave the rock in the wilderness and gave them drink out of the great depths. He brought streams also out of the rock and caused waters to run down like a river. And they sinned yet more against him by provoking the Most High in the wilderness. Certainly deciding not to hope in God and to trust in God and to follow God, to rather turn back in the day of battle. Look at this slippery slope that it causes. The established precedent is, is that no matter what great things God does, I will not believe it, but I will rebel. And for fear, turn in the day of battle. He's given me the armament. He's given me the weapons that I need to succeed in that day. And nevertheless, I'm choosing to sin more and more. I'm choosing to provoke the Most High in the wilderness. Verse 18, it says, And they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. <laughs> God had provided so much care and nourishment provided sustenance that they needed it tasted like honey that manna looked like bedellium gave them water out of rocks and they said give us meat that they might satisfy their own lust verse 19 it says yea they spake against god they said can god furnish a table in the wilderness Behold, he smote the rock that the waters gushed out and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide flesh for his people? Look, we need to be satisfied when God provides. Not look at all that God provides and be like, can he do more though? Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Yeah, yeah, he gave us water. Yeah, yeah, he gave us food to collect as a miracle that we could be sustained he protected us. Their clothes didn't even wear when they were wandering about then. He led them with the pillars of fire and cloud, respectively. Yeah, but can he also do this? Satisfy my lust. Let's see. That question is asked. Can he furnish a table in the wilderness? Verse 21, Therefore the Lord heard this and was wroth. We blame him. So a fire was kindled against Jacob, and anger also came up against Israel, because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation. Though he had commanded the clouds from above, and opened the doors of heaven, and had rained down manna upon them to eat, and had given them of the corn of heaven, man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full. And look at their sin there. They believed not. They trusted not. They didn't have faith in God, though he had done all of these things. They ask, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Look at all the incredible things that he had done to this incredulous group. Incredible, hard to believe. Hard to imagine God dropping angels' food upon these people. Hard to imagine him 
parting the sea. It's hard to imagine him busting open a rock and allowing waters to gush out. It's incredible what he did. Hard to believe. The grace that he gave to these people. And in return, they questioned him. They asked him more. They asked more. They, they tempted him. They sinned. Provoked him to wrath. Incredible. Hard to believe grace to this incredulous people. Incredulous. Those that are unwilling or unable to believe. God did what is incredible to the incredulous. He did what's hard to believe to those that are simply unwilling to believe it. Those that could not believe. Nevertheless, he furnished them, but they didn't have the faith to give back to them. They did not believe. They trusted not in him. They hoped not in God. They forgot the works of, their fa- of, the, of God the Father, and they would not keep the commandments. Why? Because his testimony wasn't established generation to generation to generation and that slippery slope that Ephraim seemed to have kicked off when they said you know what I'm not trusting God I'm going back he's done all these things for me but I'm just going to go home maybe we'll fight another day Matthew chapter 15 Matthew chapter 15 If we truly know the testimony of God, if we truly know, not just read it and go, yeah, that's cool that he parted the Red Sea. I know that. But if we know that, it, we believe that, we, we trust that, we even say that that could be done in our lives, in our own hearts. And we have that statement in John 3 and verse 33 applied to us. He that hath received his testimony. When we truly know and receive the testimony of God, he that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. You think of the old-fashioned seal, right? They'd melt wax and then they would stamp it to close off that envelope. And that seal would be an indication of who it was that had closed that envelope. When you set to your seal... It's like that effect. You're, you're, you're stamping it. You're sealing it. You're approving it. This is, this is what I believe. Set to your seal that God is true when you receive of his testimony. That's what we need to be. We need to be those that believe in, hope in, trust in him fully. And as a result, we will be fully furnished. Look, those that of Ephraim that turned in the day of battle... Did they not taste of the manna? Did they not have the water? Did they not have soles of their feet that were not away? Did they not see the great miracles? That, yeah, they were furnished in that way, but they were not fully furnished unto good works. And that's where I'm going to close off the sermon. They were not fully furnished to go through with what was expected of them in the day of battle. And we need to set to our seal that God is true as we receive his testimony in order to be fully furnished. Follow me to be fully furnished. Believe in, hope in, trust in God. So we'll ask that question again. They asked it mockingly, but it is a good question. It's not rhetorical. Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Yes, absolutely, and then some. He can thoroughly, thoroughly, absolutely furnish that table in the wilderness. You can trust that. The question then that follows up, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Yes. Now, do we believe that? Believest thou this? That question was asked, and that's what we need to seek our hearts and and try to understand about ourselves. Do we actually believe that God can furnish our table in the wilderness? Do we actually believe that God can provide what we need in a place where there is nothing? Matthew chapter 15, we'll continue on in verse... 21. Matthew 15 and verse 21. The Bible says, Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered, her not a word. So it says there in verse 21, he 
went thence and departed where he was and came into the coast of Sidon. Tyre and Sidon is a nation that hugs the, the, um, the coast that runs up right beside the top peak of Israel. You have Dan there, which is often referred to as, you know, when God wants to tra- talk about the, the lengths and breadths of Israel, he talks about Dan as the furthest region. Directly west of Dan, you'll find Tyre. A little bit north of that, you'll find Sidon. It's clear, though, that he wasn't in Dan or the nation of Israel. Otherwise, why does it say departed and went into? He specifically went into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. And when he did, a woman came out of the same coast. They came out of Tyre and Sidon and went unto him. She's of the unbelieving nations. She's of the the what would be called the the samaritans in that area they even further away than the samaritans there was no mixing of the jews religion which is what they hated of the samaritans because that they were part of heathen and part of judaism that's why the woman at the well knew a lot about jacob and knew a lot about it because she she'd adopted some of it but they were mostly they, they, they were mixed right it's like a house that's that's like a christian and a jew or or, or, or a, a divided house right they knew a little bit of both religions that's why they hate it but these are beyond that we have tyre we have sidon god uses tyre as an example when he's dealing with the great unbelief of his people and he says if tyre had heard these things they would have repented in other words what he was saying to them was tyre hasn't heard these things and jesus walks in there that unbelieving nation he comes in there and immediately finds a woman searching for and seeking after mercy from the Lord, the son of David. This woman would have been incredulous. Why? Because she was unable to believe. Why was she unable to believe? Well, there is no good physical, rational reason why that woman would come to Jesus. She wasn't brought up in the religion. She wasn't brought up in judaism or old testament teachings she knew nothing of that a complete unbeliever she perhaps had her own idols and her own things maybe she came to the realization that they were dumb blind and could do nothing for her she was at the end of her rope have mercy on me O lord thou son of david my daughter is grievously vexed with a devil the end of her rope unable to believe in christ because she had not heard of his wonderful testimony as of yet she comes anyway, seeking him for mercy. Now here comes another good teaching moment. Verse 23, the second part of it, it says, And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. They must have saw Jesus in his silence toward her. She comes and says, I, I'm vexed. My daughter is vexed with the devil. Grievously, Lord, O oh, son of David, please help. Please have mercy on me. And Jesus answers not. And his disciples were like, she keeps crying after you. Just send her away. Let's, let's get her out of here. Jesus wasn't silent because he didn't want to speak to her and show her mercy. Jesus was silent because it was time to teach the disciples again. For their sake, he was silent. We're about to speak. Send her away, they say, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, if you remember back in our teaching, follow me to reach the world, Jesus makes this statement, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of the world, but he, he actually showed how he was sent to the whole world. So this statement isn't just saying that he's only going after those of physical Israel to get them saved, as, as some often say. He's making that statement because he's, he's, he's creating a new nation. The nation of spiritual Israel. Israel, according to the flesh, is, is, is you know, one step in the, in the grave and the other on a banana peel as far as being in God's will and, being, and being, having God working with them and through them and, and in them. They're about to be removed so that others can be grafted in. So it, Jesus makes that statement, but if they were listening, they would say, no, you're not just going to the house of Israel, you're going to reach the world. That's why I believe it's very likely he's talking about a different Israel. 
And I asked the question also, if he wasn't trying to catch fish in Tyre and Sidon, which of course is not of Israel, then why is he there? Why is he chumming the waters? If he's not trying to fish in Tyre, why did he put his boat there? Right? Jesus went there for a purpose, of course, and he's, he's, he's preparing to teach his disciples something, even as he goes. His disciples see this woman grievously vexed. Maybe they heard his, his statement in verse 24, as, as they often did, as a physical exclamation. I'm not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay, then, Jesus, send her away, and then let's get back to Israel. Verse 25, it continues, Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meat to take the children's bread, cast it to the dogs. Is it meat then? The question I ask is, is to take somebody that is without and, and give what belongs to physical Israel. Is it meat to take from physical Israel and give it to them that are without? Is that suitable? Is that right? Well, Jesus clearly states here, it's, it's not. It's not meat to take from them and to give to the dogs. Just making that statement dealing with them being unbelievers and outsiders. And maybe the disciples at this time said, you're right, it is not suitable. So again, let's get out of here. Let's get back to reaching the people of Israel that you were sent to. Verse 27, it says, truth, Lord. And she said, she said, truth, Lord, responding to this. Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it, even un, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. Her daughter was made whole from that very hour. And Jesus departed from thence and came unto the Sea of Galilee and went up into a mountain and sat down there. Continues on. What an incredulous woman, unable <laughs> to believe. And yet, though what he was offering was hard to believe, even impossible to believe for a woman like this. She comes and through faith is fully furnished by God. Everything that she came and asked for was given to her. Verse 28, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. Whatever you would like. Why? Because she approached him by faith. Of course it was hard for her to believe. Nearly impossible she did not know the testimony. She did not know the Lord like these had should have known the Lord. And so she makes that statement of a truth. I don't know anything of this. You're teaching your people. You, you have your people. I'm of another nation. But may I just have some crumbs which fall from their table. And Jesus says, it's enough. You're healed. She's healed. We continue on and we saw that Jesus departed thence went unto the Sea of Galilee and went up into a mountain and sat down there. Verse 30, And great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maim, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet. And he healed them, insomuch that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to be whole, the lame to walk, and the blind to see. And they glorified the God of Israel. Remember, we're talking about an incredulous person. A group of people that it is hard for them to believe, or rather, the incredulous means that they are unwilling to believe or they are unable to believe. And when you look at a group like the maimed, the blind, the halt, the lame, it seems like they would be unable to believe. When you've gone through something like that, isn't it hard to believe that God is working in your life? He's there, He's present. When, when you can't see because of something you've been born into, when you've been maimed from birth or because of circumstances that happen, you're blind, you're, you're deaf. You're dumb. You cannot speak. Unable to believe certainly would be a problem for them. How hard would it be for them to believe? Impossible even to understand and to comprehend and to know and set it to your seal that God would have grace for me. But the impossible and, and wonderful and, and incredible thing about our God is that not only did he have grace for these, he had grace to spare. 
And at Jesus' feet, these came and were furnished. They were arranged. They, they were prepared. They were made whole that very hour as they simply offered him faith and received exactly what they came for. Here's another good time for teaching. Jesus, verse 32, called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting. And his disciples say unto him, Whence should we have so much bread in the wilderness as to fill so great a multitude? They're asking, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Unable to believe. It's hard to believe, Jesus. And Jesus saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? And they said, Seven, and a few little fishes. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took of the seven loaves and the fishes, and gave thanks, and brake them, and gave to his disciples, and the disciples to the multitude. It's amazing. Look at verse 34. They have seven loaves of bread and a few little fishes. And by the time it gets into Jesus' possession, in verse 36, he took the seven loaves and the fishes. They went from being little, didn't they? <laughs> little is much when God is in it. They're no longer little fishes, and they're going to be multiplied. Verse 37, And they did eat, they did all eat, and were filled. And they took up of the broken meat that was left, seven baskets full, and they that did eat were 4,000 men besides women and children. And he sent away the multitude and took ship and came into the coast of Magdala. Can God furnish a table? Can he arrange, provide a table? In the wilderness, of course he can. The wilderness being that place of hopelessness, of desolateness, of a, a, a place that there is nothing but, to the disciples, seven loaves and a few fishes. Jesus was able to fill them all with it in this time of, of, of hard-to-believe scenarios. Now, this is another incredulous group, unable to believe, being his own disciples here, unfortunately. Enter the, under, the other than incredulous group, and these are those that will not believe. So it's one thing to be unable to believe. When you go and you preach the gospel to people, that's hard to believe. I'm unable to believe that. Why? I've never heard of that. It wasn't told me from generation to generation. I didn't grow up Christian. I grew up in another faith. It's hard to believe that God would send his son to save me, and all I have to do is trust him by faith. Incredulous. It's hard. To, I'm unable to believe that. Right? But these believe because, because they, they eventually applied their faith to him, and, and, and he... He used that and gave them exactly what they asked for. <clears throat> the other group is those that will not believe. And this is a real problem. This is Psalm 78 that we read about just a little while ago. But it's the worst case. And it's the progression. Where we saw Ephraim. They just turned back in the day of battle. They didn't want to get into that fight. And as a result, through the ripples of time and their journey, they just sunk deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper to the point where not only did they not or were they unable to believe God could work in their lives at that time, they got to the point where they simply would not believe. I will not believe. I choose not to believe. What comes after that? Apathy. What comes after that? Rebellion. What comes after that? You know what? The worst of scenarios. Scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. And that's the next group we talk about. Will not believe. Refuse to believe, no matter what is put before me. It was the case of these... Pharisees and Sadducees. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 1. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came. So remember, we saw a few groups come to Jesus at this same time. Here, the Pharisees and the Sadducees didn't come that they could be healed. They didn't come that they could be fed. They didn't come for to hear his preaching. They came tempting him, desiring him that he would show them a sign from heaven. Now in another passage, John chapter 6 and verse 30, it says, What sign showest thou then? These same scribes and Pharisees talking to Christ. May even be the same example. What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? 
What are you going to do? How are you going to show me? There's a group that was not willing to believe. Show us a sign, then maybe we will. Do you think they would have? Abraham said to Lazarus there, or the rich man, though one should rise from the dead, if they will not believe. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. These Pharisees are no different. He was doing miracles. They saw the feeding of the 5,000. They saw the feeding of the 7,000. 4,000, 5,000, sorry. They saw the miracles. They saw the healings. And now they're tempting him, desiring a sign from heaven. As if heaven coming down and performing signs on earth wasn't enough. Verse 2, it says, And he answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? The Bible records that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth His handiwork. And these had that saying, Red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky in the morning, sailors take warning. And they thought that they could predict the weather in that case. They could discern the weather. They could discern the skies and how, how the weather would be the next day. The face of the sky was clear to them. They had it all understood. Well, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. handiwork. If you can discern the sky, if you can discern the weather in that case, Romans chapter 1 and verse 20 says, The invisible things of this earth are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. This is what he's saying to them. You can discern the skies but you can't discern the signs of the times. You can't discern Christ is among you. You're without excuse. Of these Pharisees, the statement came to my mind, you know, they, they run around in the temple discerning the temporal. Another verse is, with your mouth you do worship me, but your hearts are far from me. That's what he said to them. They were really good at the temporal things. They were really good at the fleshly things, the carnal things, the show. Looking good, sounding good, talking good, walking good. They could even discern the weather. They had this realm all figured out, but zero understanding, spiritually speaking. They ran around in the temple discerning the temporal. The temple was supposed to be a picture of heaven. It was supposed to remind them of God. It was a place where they would go and worship God and use various instruments that pictured God Almighty God, and yet they used all of these items to satisfy what is temporal, what is carnal, earthly, sensual, devilish, the Bible says. Hypocrites. Looking for signs. Verse 4 says, A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. Hypocrites, wicked, adulterous, no sign, and he walks away. <laughs> <clears throat> But one thing you find that's, that's, that's different about their approach to Christ and everyone else's is they seem to come for him. You notice the woman of Canaan comes and says, O Lord, thou son of David, going to him, addressing him. My daughter is grievously vexed. Have mercy upon me. The great multitudes come in verse 30, having with them those that are lame and blind and dumb and maimed, and they lay them down at whose feet? Jesus' feet in particular, going to him. The disciples come and they kind of misunderstand the situation and say what they say and they're about to learn a lesson and that's, that's fine and well and good. The multitudes were there because they wanted to be with him. 
He says very clearly in verse 32, They continue with me now three days and have nothing. They came to know him, know his testimony, know what he's doing, know his works. And the Pharisees also come and they just say, Show us a sign. They came, but it doesn't say here they came to him. They simply came and said, Where's the sign? Where's the miracle? Show us what thou doest. What dost thou work? What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? So he departed. You'll get the sign of Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And he departed. Verse 5, it says, When his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten bread. So it seems that when they got on the ship, they forgot about verse 37, where they gathered up all these fragments of meat, and they forgot to pack themselves a lunch out of it. So they realize that it comes to their mind. And then Jesus begins to teach. Verse 6, And Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Verse 7, And they reasoned among themselves, saying, ah, It's because we have taken no bread. They thought falling short in verse 37, and the realization they came to in verse, 40, verse 5 was exactly what Jesus was trying to teach them. <clears throat> Unfortunately, all of us are thinking temporally about these spiritual truths. So they reason among themselves. They try to, they try to rationalize what just took place, and, and they say, oh, Jesus is rebuking us for food <laughs> because we didn't bring any food. Verse 8, which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye little of faith, why reason ye among yourselves because ye have brought no bread? That is enough to, I think, kick your faith into overdrive. <laughs> Jesus just heard my, my thoughts and showing himself to be God. Verse 9, do ye not understand, neither remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets ye took up? Twelve baskets there. Neither the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many baskets ye took up? Seven baskets full. How is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. How is it you do not understand? I took a little bit of a packed lunch and made so much over that everyone was full and there was some remaining. Twice in the last few days. How is it you don't understand I'm not talking about bread here? I'm talking about the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Now we know the progression of leaven is that a little will become a lot. You put a little leaven in a lump and it will continue to permeate the thing until the whole is leavened. Therefore, whenever leaven is put into something, the whole puffs up. And if that leaven is of the Pharisees and of the scribes and what Jesus is talking about here, that little leaven will leaven the whole lump, will bubble to the surface, come out and defile, even as they're already witnessing. They open their mouths and it defiles everybody around them, these scribes and these Pharisees, these hypocrites. Beware of it. We're to eat our bread unleavened is the picture Christ uses, pure, plain, as is. Leavened bread is like leavened doctrine. It may be filled, it may be voluminous, it may look substantial, but it's mostly just full of hot air, isn't it? Verse 12, it says, Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And this is the problem. This is what Jesus wants to warn them about. And their doctrine stems from the fact that they 
will not believe. Look, God will take a believing man, a believing woman, a woman that wants to trust and hear from God, and and a a man that wants to trust and hear from God, even as he took these that have no reason whatsoever, this woman of Canaan, of some foreign nation that comes to Christ, there's no reason why she would even know a thing about Jesus, and nevertheless he, he takes her faith and opens up truth to her and is able to heal her daughter as a result of the little bit of faith that you have. The great multitudes He's able to heal the lame, the blind, the dumb, the maimed, those that really there was no reason for them to believe in the mercy of an almighty God because they had had the bum rap, as it were. Born lame, born blind. How could God allow this to happen to me? Nevertheless, when they're at his feet and they see Jesus, he's able to take the little bit of faith that they do have and do great things for them, make them perfectly whole, furnished, prepared, able. Then he takes the multitudes and with a little lunch makes a whole smorgasbord meal for all to be full and taken care of he furnished that table in the wilderness these pharisees they refuse to believe and as a result they go down that psalm 78 path they refuse to believe they refuse to do the works and then they fall deeper and deeper and deeper into sin and it's contagious just like leaven is Leavened bread, leavened doctrine looks filled, voluminous. It may look substantial, but it's mostly hot air. Go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We want to be furnished. Can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Yeah, amen, absolutely. He can provide for the food that we need, the water that sustains us. He gives us life. He gives us strength to go on. We want to be furnished, certainly. 2 Timothy 3, it says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. As these Pharisees, it says, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, Fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such, turn away. And this is the end of those Pharisees. They choose not to believe. I will not believe. And so they become the men of these perilous times, these last days. Verse 7, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You're to turn away from such. Even as Jesus says, beware of the leaven of the scribes and of the Pharisees. He wants to give us something substantial. He wants to furnish us. And how is he going to do it? Verse 13 says this trend will continue even more in these last days. Beware of it. It says, verse 13, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. It's it's reciprocal. They're deceiving and they're being deceived. Deceiving and being deceived. You can see how it's compared to leaven. It it eventually permeates. It, It multiplies and multiplies and grows and grows, waxing worse and worse and worse and worse. But, verse 14, continue thou. Now he's addressing the disciples. He's addressing Timothy. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and has been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them so we're to continue in what we have learned and even as it said when we when we learn of christ know that who has given them to us these this testimony this truth we set it to our seal in other words we establish it and when you establish it and set it to your zeal it's a mark on you your faith in God and your and your trust in his scriptures and your and your seeking after his testimony and, and 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 letting his word permeate through you and work through you. When you know that to be the case, you continue in those very things. Verse 15, and this was what was commanded in Psalm 78, it says, In that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So Timothy's grandmother and mother and and their family before them knew what Psalm 78 was saying. Teach it to your children and to your children and to your children. That they wouldn't be 
incredulous, as it were. They wouldn't find it hard to believe because they were of some unbelieving nation or people. They wouldn't find it hard to believe because, because they had, had grown up in, in a harsh environment. That's kind of the picture of the one that's blind or, or, or maimed. or they, they, they grew up in a, in a faithless situation, finding it hard to believe. They wouldn't find themselves going down that road where not only is it, is it hard to believe, and I cannot believe, but now I just don't want to believe. They taught him from a child to know the Holy Scriptures, to trust the Holy Scriptures, to believe on and hope on the Holy Scriptures because they are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith. They taught him the faith. They taught him that he had to believe on those Scriptures, believe in Christ to know them and to know them and to know them, to be assured of these things even as he learns them. So that he can continue in them. How do we get furnished? These days. Verse 16. All scripture is given. It's a gift. It is given by inspiration of God. And is profitable. It will benefit you. It will strengthen you. It will lift you up. It is profitable for doctrine. That's teachings. That's, that's, that's giving you understanding. It is, it is profitable for reproof. That is, that is confirming things, establishing them in your mind, making, making you making full proof of what's happening here. In other words, just affirming it to you. So you don't just know it, you know it. For correction. In other words, I was, I was doing this and the scriptures is like an eraser to rub it up. That was wrong. Let's do it right this time. Correcting you. Leading you to repentance and instruction in righteousness. In other words, you didn't do it this way. You ought not do it this way is what the Bible shows you. Repent of that and it instructs you how to do it right. It's the scriptures that come by inspiration of God. Do you know what the Pharisees give you? Something that is of no substance that simply comes by expiration. Those little leavens, those little yeast bugs that just die off and make hot air when they're cooked. There's no substance there. But God says to us, go to the scriptures, given by inspiration of God. They'll teach you doctrine. They'll reprove you. They'll correct you. They'll instruct you, instruct you in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, complete, there, truly furnished unto all good works. Remember Ephraim, they were furnished. That day of battle, they had their armaments. They had their weapons. They were thoroughly furnished, but they didn't go on to all good works, did they? They turned back. But if you want to be complete, if you want to be furnished for the days that are ahead, prepared unto battle, and not just prepared for the battle, but you're actually going to get into it, get involved and fight the good fight of faith. You need to be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works, and that comes from scriptures. Continuing in them, knowing them, finding the wisdom in them, learning them. Not just every Sunday, every day of the week. Go to God, like those that were healed. By faith, ask Him. Show Him. Tell Him what you need. God, I'll even take a crumb that falls from the table of somebody whose life you are working in. Fall at his feet and worship him and say, God, I'm blind. God, I can't hear. Go to God. Let him furnish you. Can God furnish a table in the wilderness when there is no hope? When there's death? When there's destruction? When there's mourning? When there's sickness, when there's ailments, when there's hurt, harm, blind, maimed, halt, you name it. The wilderness, death, destruction, misery. In that wilderness that is this world, can God furnish a table? Yes. Truly, He can furnish it. Open up the table of your hearts, Christian, and let God furnish your table.
with his scriptures. We see the examples that affirm what's being taught here to Timothy. A man that while he had a good start is still being encouraged to continue. You may have a good start. You may be on the right path. But tomorrow, continue. And the day after, continue. And teach your children and continue. And teach your children and have them teach their children that they would know, that they would be wise, that they would have the Holy Scriptures upon them, even from a child. Teach others around you. Teach others that you know. We need to be people that are teaching others of these things, furnishing others unto good works through the living Word of God. There's so many scribes and Pharisees out there blowing hot air, providing bread that has no substance. Living bread here is what we have. We're furnished. We can be perfect unto all good works. Just give them your faith. Let him use you. Thank you, God, for this word, Lord. Thank you for your scripture spoken in due time. I pray, God, that we would hear these things and heed them, hearken unto them, apply them to our lives. We begin to understand more and more deeply and intimately the things that you're trying to teach us. Not just knowing them, Lord, but, but really experiencing them, knowing them for sure. Setting them to our seal that God is true. And that you want to reveal truth in us and you want to reveal truth through us. God, in these last days, I think we need to be reminded that there's places like Tyre and Sidon, Lord, where, where though it may be very hard for them to believe because they have no background in it, you're preparing the heart of some woman who's hurting for her child to come to you. Lord, there's a multitude out there that is sick, that is blind, maimed, halt, lame, that have given up all faith. And, and, and you know, how could a God do something like this to me? They're just waiting for us to bring them to you and lay them at your feet so you can heal them. Lord, us as, as disciples, as followers of Christ, we, we have unbelief in our hearts. You do miracles before us. You feed thousands with small bagged lunch. And yet we don't see it. We need to be healed. Come to your feet, even as the people you're instructing us to lead to you. Help us to have that, that me first mentality, that in me first you might show forth all of your long suffering and all of your mercy and all of the wonderful works that you have done. Help these things to come to our lives first, that we would know them, even as Timothy here knew them. But that wasn't the end. We need to know them and teach them and know them and teach them and know them and teach them. Lord, we here in this church don't want to turn back in the day of battle. You've given us the arms, you've given us the weapons, everything we we have we need, but we don't want to turn back because we didn't believe all that you could do. Help our unbelief, even as we go. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I didn't even prepare a song. Channels only. Uh, 332. 332. How I praise thee. Precious Savior, that thy love laid hold of me. Thou hast saved and cleansed and filled me, that I might thy channel be. Channels only, blessed Master, but with all thy wondrous power, flowing through. that thou shouldest fill me a clean vessel in thy hand with no power but as thou givest 
graciously with each command channels only blessed master but with all thy wondrous power flowing through us thou canst use us every day and every hour witnessing thy power to save me setting free from self and sin thou who brought us to possess me in thy fullness lord come in channels only blessed master but with all thy wondrous power flowing through us thou canst use us every day and every hour jesus filled now with thy spirit hearts that full surrender know that the streams of 